Thank you. So I would like to thank Anna for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, present uh, here. So I have no disclosure. The objectives of the of my presentation uh, is to uh, are to uh, present the current assessment tool for evaluating pelvic floor muscle function uh, and discuss these in lights of muscle physiology. Uh, we will also discuss the implication of pelvic floor muscles in the pathophysiological mechanism of pain syndrome. And after that, we will uh, present the findings in the literature on the efficacy of physiotherapy. So we already hear today that uh, pelvic floor overactivity play a crucial role in several conditions, bladder, bowel elimination disorder, uh, genital pelvic pain syndromes, and sexual dysfunction. I think this emphasizes the importance of objective assessment as well as a thorough understanding of the pathophysiological pathway in order to guide the evaluation and the treatment, especially in, in physiotherapy. So first, I think we heard a lot today about what is pelvic floor muscle tone, overactivity, uh, hypertonia, tension, trigger point. Are they all synonyms? Um, so I think there's a, a lot of controversy in the terminology. Um, maybe we can just go back a bit to muscle physiology to understand uh, what is pelvic, uh, what is muscle tone in general in normally innervated muscle? So pelvic floor muscle tone is, we can define it as the resistance against stretching or movement. Um, it, 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 is, it includes two components. The first one is a passive component, which is the viscoelastic properties of the tissue, and also an active component, which basically is how the uh, contractile apparatus is active. We, uh, the previous talk, it was a lot discussed about uh, con the contractile activity, but I think we should also, we should not forget the viscoelastic or the passive component in muscle tone because these, this component can also be a problem if there is a, a chronic overactivity. So, just review uh, all the component here. So uh, there are several sources of the contractile activity, the active component. The first source is electrogenic contraction, so the normal part. So is a muscle always active at rest normally? Uh, so there's a lot, and can we record it by EMG, electromyography? Uh, actually, uh, I was surprised to find that in the literature, there's a lot of controversy if, it, if, there, if a muscle is active at rest. And now I'm talking about a muscle that is, there's no pathology, there's no pain. So, and there's controversy, but it seems that in the pelvic floor, there is a, a, a tonic activity of the pelvic floor muscle. And this section all also include electro um, the myotatic reflex. So when we stretch the muscle and it, it reacts by contracting and preventing the stretching, this is also included in the normal electrogenic contraction. And my colleague really talked to you well about the electrogenic spasm, so the, pat the pathology, uh, the pathologic activity, so some, sometimes it can be referred to spasm, so increase in EMG activity. Increase in EMG activity combined with pain. Uh, sometimes it's the synonym is muscle tension, unintentional muscle activity that is amenable to voluntary control. And uh, Mark did a talk uh, earlier about all the emotion that is can be related to muscle overactivity. Um, I think this is really interesting to us as physio because this is exactly what we train when we are using a biofeedback. We are trying to te teach our patient how to better relax their muscle. So this is the part of pelvic floor muscle tone that we are acting on when we, have, when we are using biofeedback. There's also the trigger point uh, that, is in, that are included in the contractile or the active component of tone. And it is important to mention that uh, trigger points are not recorded by regular surface EMG activity. So if we put EMG on the muscle uh, and not, on, on not needle in the trigger point, I mean, but really a surface EMG, um, there's high chance that we will not capture modification and EMG activity. Uh, so, 
So these are the active, the, the, the active component of tone. And also there's the, the viscoelastic, the passive component. So when I say passive, it's really because it is at rest. There's no activity implicated in, in this component of tone. So it is this viscoelastic uh, properties are explained by the connection between actine and myosine, the extensibility of bridges. Also the cytoskeleton, uh, so some cyto cytoprotein like titan and desmin, and also all the conjunctive tissue uh, surrounding the muscle fiber, the fascicle, and the muscle also. So what can be interesting for us as physio is to link this part of pelvic floor muscle tone to what we are using as an assessment tool. So with physio, we often use uh, digital palpation to assess the tone. Uh, I, un I underline muscle tone, general muscle tone, because there's a lot of uh, scale that we can use to grade muscle tone, uh, normal, increase, lower, plus three to minus three. So I will uh, review them with you late uh, after that. But so palpation is globally a measure of uh, global muscle tone, but also we can use palpation to identify trigger point and also to guide treatment and after treat these uh, trigger points. So EMG activity. So EMG activity, what we record with that, it is the circulating current. So when we are using EMG, we are capturing modification and EMG activity. So we, it's important to understand that EMG activity will not measure passive properties like viscoelastic tone. What about ultrasound now? Ultrasound is an in, indirect measure of pelvic floor muscle tone. It is more an action of the muscle on the, the morphometry. So it can give you some insight when you measure the hiatus, for example, to see if there is an uh, increase, if the hiatus is reduced. So it is a global measurement of muscle tone. A proxy measure, I would say. Um, the manometry, it's the same thing. So the perineal, the pressure perineometry, it's a, it, it also measure all the component together. It's global. And there's a lot of dynamometer now available on the market to measure pelvic floor muscle function. The one on the top, it's the one that we developed in Montreal, but we are not the only one. There's more than, I think we are uh, at 15 uh, different type of dynamometer. And the work that we did uh, early, um, r lately was uh, to, um, to measure global muscle tone, but I will pr also present you some uh, studies that we did when we uh, tried to record EMG to, pr to help women to really well relax and then try to capture the passive component of tone. So now what do we find in the literature about the pelvic floor muscle dysfunction in uh, women and men with pelvic floor uh, with the chronic pelvic pain? So as I said earlier, with palpation, we, we, uh, we measure global pelvic floor muscle tone, and there are several scales that are available. I don't know, are you using them in the clinic, these ones? So the first one that I really, uh, that I find that is really interesting is the rising scale. It's a scale ranging from plus three, so plus three is hypertonicity, zero is normal, and minus three is hypotonicity, so it's, it, this scale has good uh, test retest and inter-rater reliability, so it's interesting. There's also other, other scale like Lehman scale and D scale, but D scale combined with some behavior, so it's a combination with uh, withdrawal by behavior, or in if when uh, there's pain, it's automatically one grade. So these are less uh, relevant for us because uh, it, it's not only muscle that is assessed. With these, um, with these scale. There's also uh, some studies showing the uh, psychometric properties evaluating the relaxation capacity. So uh, complete relaxation zero to four if the muscle remains contracted. So, and also this one, this, uh, this kind of scale was also, uh, showed also good test-retest reliability. Uh, we can also grade absent, complete, or partial relaxation. 
Uh, and the last thing that I included here is the flexibility. So it gives you the idea if you separate the finger in lateral, lateral, how much finger or how many centimeter you can space your finger just to have an idea of the flexibility of the hiatus. So this is another uh, tool that you can use using palpation to evaluate um, muscle flexibility. So as, uh, we, uh, as my colleague presented earlier, there's also a trigger point problem in, in a patient with chronic pelvic pain. Uh, there's a high prevalence of trigger point, so 63 to 89% uh, of our patient having trigger point problem. And it is also important, you, you, you all know, most of you are physio, so you know that there is a pa pain pattern referral that sometimes when you have a trigger point, it gives pains elsewhere, like the levator hiatus referred to the supra pubic region, the urethra, the bladder perineum, the penis and the rectum. So sometimes just the trigger point can be the cause of a pain elsewhere. Same things for the uh, obturator internus, the piriformis and the rectus abdominis, the external oblique. So all these are really well-known uh, pain referral. So the area that there's more controversy is, is there an, a difference in resting EMG activity in women uh, or uh, with vulvodynia or chronic pelvic pain when we are using electromyography? Uh, so you can see here that there is study showing that there's a significant difference in women with pain and women without pain. And there's also the same amount of studies, well, not the same, there is even more, one study more showing that there is no significant difference between the two groups. This could be explained by some limitation with EMG because, it, you know, vaginal lubrication, position of the probe, uh, it's difficult to compare the intensity of the current when you're, for example, comparing 30 microvolt for one patient with another patient having 50 microvolt. It doesn't mean that there's one that has more tone than the other. It's because it's there's too much confounding factors for for comparing values of intensity like that. So this might be one factor. So the, the literature that we have available when uh, using man manometry, there's one study they showed the, that the women with PVD provoked vestibulodynia had significantly higher vaginal resting pressure than asymptomatic women. And one thing that is interesting here is that they, they ask the women to contract and relax after that. So it's, it's like a contract, relax effect. And they uh, were able to show that uh, after a contraction, the relaxation is even better. So this, this encourage our, our technique using biofeedback because we can help women to better understand how to control their muscle and better relax by training their pelvic floor muscle, not strength training, I mean, but control how to control their muscle to in order to properly uh, relax after that. So there's also studies available with um, ultrasound comparing women with provoked vestibulodynia to asymptomatic control. This is a study that we published in 2014 uh, showing that women with pain had more acute anorectal angle, larger levator plate angle, and smaller hiatus at rest. And similar findings were also found in men with chronic pelvic pain. So about the dynamometer, we uh, found also that women with uh, pelvic pain, they have higher passive forces at minimal aperture. So when the, the speculum is, uh, the two branches are closed, they also tolerated less aperture. So this is kind of a measure of flexibility when we increase the anteroposterior dynamometer by separating the two branches, they tolerated less aperture. We also did uh, a, a condition where we stretched the muscle dynamically at a constant speed. So we increased the aperture and reduced the aperture 
five times and we were able with that to assess the passive forces so the tone and also the stiffness sometimes you hear that word too stiffness it's the variation of force divided by the variation of uh, of change in the muscle length and uh, we what is really interesting is when we monitor the EMG to isolate uh, the passive contribution of tone we also find that women with pain they have also increase in tone due to the passive component so it's not only overactivity what we what we can hypothesize is that chronic overactivity of the muscle can lead to viscoelastic modification um, there's also a study uh, using the myoton pro to evaluate the muscle stiffness it is an external device that press on the muscle to evaluate the tone. So this was found to be uh, different between women with and without pain. So it is a measure of global muscle tone, but when we control for EMG activity, we, we are able to isolate the viscoelastic contribution. So if we summarize all the evidence here is that women with vulvodynia or chronic pelvic pain, they have elevated global pelvic floor muscle tone, they have also trigger point, they have increased viscoelastic properties, and some patients, they also have electrogenic causes uh, evaluated by EMG, and we can like, uh, do the same trend uh, of result for men with chronic prostatitis, because there's some results that um, suggest the same alteration. A lot of studies also evaluated the contractile properties in uh, women with uh, PVD. So they showed that there's also strength reduction, reduction in speed of contraction and coordination, and also reduction of endurance in the pelvic floor muscle. So now you may be interested in what about the efficacy of physio. I concentrate more my research on, on vulvodynia. Uh, my previous co my colleague also talked about other studies in, uh, in bladder uh, pain problems. So uh, I think it's a good thing I will complete um, with on, a, on another condition here. So um, EMG biofeedback, this is the modality that has been most often studied in the research. So it addressed the electrogenic causes of tone. So there's a lot of studies showing that it is significant to reduce pain in those patients. So it, we really focus on the electrogenic compartment of tone when we are using EMG. The same thing for general relaxation technique that we use uh, often with our patient. We can find also evidence about electrical stimulation. There is different type of current. Uh, the first one is, is the TENS, so it's a current targeting pain. There's also some studies about uh, electrical stimulation for provoking a muscle contraction. And the, the idea behind this is that when we use, when we make the muscle contract, after that it will relax more. Um, so, and it will help relaxation and improve the strength and control. And these studies that you can see here, they showed good, a significant result in reducing pain in the uh, inner patient with vulvodynia. Manual therapy, there is a, what is really interesting is there is growing numbers of randomized controlled trial, high, high quality randomized controlled trial showing that it is effective trigger point myofascial release. It is effective for reducing pain in IC and in uh, and, uh, and patient with chronic uh, prostatitis. Um, I, I want also to point out one interesting study from Wes. They showed that when they are doing manual therapy and trigger point release, it also lead to a reduction of the electrogenic spasm. So it, it seems that there is an interconnection between trigger point and also electrogenic causes, so e increase in EMG activity. So they showed that after treating trigger points, the EMG activity at rest were even lower after treatment. So we also use stretching or insertion technique in her, uh, with her patient, and there's two studies showing that it, it, is it helps to significantly reduce pain in women with dyspareunia. Uh, they also showed that auto-insertion is, is, is an effective adjuvant to other therapies like medication. 
And uh, there's not a lot of studies supporting that on the pelvic floor, but there is in the general skeletal muscle, the proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So this is the contract relax technique that we know. We ask the, the patient to contract and then it helps them to relax and further stretch their muscle. So you may be interested in multimodal physiotherapy treatment because this is what we are usually doing in, in our clinic. We are not often using single modalities, but most of the time we are combining modalities to increase the efficacy. Uh, so there's uh, three studies, pilot studies or retrospective studies. These are small numbers of patients, but it is promising because they showed a reduction of pain in 51 to 7 77 percent of, of patients and these are in women with provoked vestibulodynia. They also showed improvement in sexual function and all of the above, tone, improvement in relaxation, flexibility and increase in strength, uh, all these, this was evaluated with palpation. So this, they, this, this showed really interesting uh, study. So this is why we decided to undertake, un we undertook a randomized control trial uh, on the efficacy of physiotherapy treatment compared to overnight topical lidocaine we, uh, to in women with vestibulodynia. We selected topical lidocaine because it is one of the most uh, pr uh, frequently prescribed treatment in, um, in women with vulvodynia in North America. <coughs> So we completed this study really recently in 212 women. They were randomized to physio or either physio or lidocaine for 10 weeks. So we had only 8% dropout. Um, so 94 completed the follow-up at six months with for physio and 101 for, um, for lidocaine, topical lidocaine. And what it's really interesting is <coughs> that both treatments showed significant reduction of pain. But when we look at the, the slope of the changes, the physio showed significantly, was significantly more effective. This, and it is when we compare to the post-treatment value, physiotherapy were, was also more effective for reducing pain and the result remained at six month follow-up. Uh, so this is interesting because physiotherapy allowed a reduction from a severe pain to a moderate to a non-pain, uh, whereas lidocaine, lidocaine women stays in the moderate in pain intensity. So, and this is also clinically relevant uh, because it, it is a change more than 1.5. Uh, what about the sexual uh, function and sexual distress? Both uh, treatment uh, resulted in significant reduction, uh, well, significant changes in uh, sexual function. So improvement in sexual function and reduction in sexual distress. But Again, physiotherapy was found to be more effective at post-treatment and at six months. And another thing that is interesting is if we look at the physio, it, the mean was higher than the um, uh, after treatment than the cutoff of 26.5 for sexual dysfunction. So it seems that physio helped women to, so the mean to, uh, to uh, well, they, feel they, they fell in the, s in the category without sexual dysfunction. And this was not the case for lidocaine. So about satisfaction, they had 8.9 uh, on 10. They were 8.9 on 10 satisfied at post-treatment and 8.5 uh, uh, at a six-month follow-up. And about lidocaine, it was around 5. Um, this, the same thing happened when we asked them about their global impression of change. 79% in the physiotherapy group were very much or much improved by physiotherapy uh, compared to 40% in the lidocaine group. So about the muscle, because I've been talking a lot of about of the muscle today, so we found that only the physiotherapy group improved their pelvic floor muscle function. This, uh, there was no change in the lidocaine uh, group. And this, these modalities, passive forces, maximal aperture, maximal strength, the number of contraction and the slope of the ascending curve, so uh, how fast they are contracting or how fast they are, uh, they are relaxing. Um, so this improved uh, more significantly more in the physio treatment at post-treatment and at six months. Um, 
with the only exception with the passive force. Uh, there is explanation for this because this cohort of patient had a really, they, they didn't add that much of pelvic floor overactivity or hypo hypertonicity because they had one newton and this, what this we can compare this to normal population though. So they, they were not that affected for their muscle to the cohort, uh, to the number of, uh, according to their tone for, from what we know in the, um, in the inner in the, or work in the lab, sorry about that. So in conclusion, multimodal physiotherapy uh, is effective in reducing pain, sexual distress, fear of pain and catastrophizing, as well as improving sexual function in women with PVD. Physiotherapy significantly improves pelvic floor muscle function, strength coordination, control and flexibility. And uh, so overall, physiotherapy uh, proved to be more effective than a frequently first-line treatment overnight uh, lidocaine, the topical application. So, of course, further studies will be needed to evaluate the efficacy in other, because there's a lot of other chronic pelvic pain syndrome, so uh, we can pursue our effort in other population to, to look at the efficacy. Thank you.